Carmen, welcome to the College Freedom Forum, Universidad Francisco Marroquín. Please tell us, what do you think people need to know about you? I think instead of knowing about me, I would prefer them to know about Hong Kong. Um, Hong Kong was once a relatively free uh, city that we have a partially uh, democratic system. But um, after the uh, hangover to China in 1997, um, our human rights situation is deteriorating and um, the crackdowns on rule of law and also freedom and democracy are happening. And it, it's only been worsening uh, since uh, Chinese rule over, the, uh, the Chinese Communist Party rule over Hong Kong and after a uh, number of major protests happened in Hong Kong. Tell me about how you got involved in, in the struggle for freedom. Um, you were a young student, very active politically and also you held um, an office that was through elections. Tell me a little bit about that. I think being a uh, resistant power uh, was something that I was born with because all, all the generations of Hong Kongers, we've been oppressed by uh, either a colonial government or by an authoritarian regime. And um, so when I was really young, when I uh, learned about, when I care about the society, I know that there, I knew that there were inequalities. I knew that there were oppressions to people of Hong Kong. So, um, and I started to become um, active in activism scenes uh, when I was in high school. Yeah, there was a, um, a protest against the uh, patriotic education in high schools. So um, I, along with many of the high school students, by that time I went on the street to strike and to, um, yeah, to speak up for ourselves. And that came to the umbrella movement and then the 2019 movement. And uh, during those times, uh, I think not only because as a Hong Konger, but as a person who embraced the value of uh, democracy and free freedom, um, I feel that there is an obligation for a people who have a free mind to speak up against the tyrannies, the authoritarian regime. So when I hear you speak, I, I can feel the students mobilizing in the streets. I can feel that energy that is still reminiscence in you. Um, and so your struggle began there, but then you held elected office. What was the transition from being a student leader to voicing your concern and being elected? There were more obligation after I was elected because when I uh, engage in activism as a person, as an individual, I, only, I was only responsible to perhaps myself and perhaps the cause that I was advocating for. But as a elected representative, I represent the people who voted for me, the people who trusted me. So um, I think there are more, oblig there, there were more obligation when I was serving in the district council. And can you tell me a little bit about what do those people that you represented we're looking for? What did they want? It was really simple um, and straightforward for uh, general um, supporters of mine uh, because I was elected amid of the whole movements and people who voted for me, they actually voted for democracy and freedom. So I do think that they, supports, uh, I, they supported what I believed. And also there's one really simple um, ask for them is to is they was they wanted the government to um, to give back um, the Hong Kong, which once was bright, free, and people were people could freely speak, people could have their own choices, and um, and wanted the governments to realize the promise they've made and written in the law in 
like way back before uh, the handover in 97. It is interesting. What I hear is proud people wanting to have control over their lives, control over their destiny. And you represented them well, but you paid a high price for speaking your, your ideas and for confronting the other power. Tell us a little bit about how did you end up being persecuted? To be honest, comparing to the 1,840 political prisoners in Hong Kong now, I, I really do feel that I am so lucky that I could have a chance to leave the country so I could be freed from uh, being imprisoned. And comparing the sacrifices or everything that I lost with those political prisoners, I, I I do think that was not a big deal for me, but still, um, I I fled Hong Kong because um, during the time I was in the office of the legislative uh, of the district council, I got harassed and surveillance happened on me, and uh, I recall that time there were there were multiple black seven seater when um waited near my home like every day and following me and there were also state media trying to harass me and um shadowed me near the constituency that i used to work at and then during that moment i do really sense the fear like how they impose the fear to the free freedom fighters and then, um, yeah, it was quite tough, but then, uh, and also, but, uh, I mean, but for the reason that I, I left Hong Kong was because I don't want to be another burden for the whole civil society, because, you know, the cause for a person being persecuted, being, uh, end up in jail, the cause was too high because not only I myself would lose freedom, but then my families and the cost to uh, for uh, lawyer support, legal support, and everything else. The cost was too high to have one more, just one more political prisoner. And I, I feel that there may be still something that I could do if I flee Hong Kong. I could still continue to advocate for Hong Kong like what I'm doing now. I could rebuild help rebuilding the civil society all abroad. There was a reason that why I decided to leave. So leaving Hong Kong and going international, you have found that the movement continues. And what do you think the international community and other people uh, should we know or do about your situation? Uh, so apparently the Hong Kong issue has a really, um, uh, has a really close, is closely related with uh, China issue. And um, we could see that nowadays, um, China is trying to swift their narrative in the international community towards them. And um, trying to, they, they uh, the CCP is trying to unify the power of dictators, the power of autocracies together uh, in order to, you know, to defeat democracies. And um, it, it really posed a threat to the Hong Kong diaspora and also uh, 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 marginalized groups, for example, like oppressed by China, for example, like Tibet and Uyghurs and also perhaps Taiwanese as well. And um, it is really essential for the international community to realize the threat of China, uh, not only to uh, human rights, but also to the country's uh, security. So if countries could realize this kind of like, could, could realize the China, China's threat, it, it would be easier for us to advocate because um, at least they will listen to us, yeah. And what is a message of hope you want to send uh, young students out there about you or your cause, okay. or about being young in general? 
I always think that um, the future belongs to the younger generations. Um, the younger generations have has so many potentials to reshape the the world, uh, the international community, and uh, I do think that whenever there is next generation, there will be hope. Because I used to be a young generation, but for now, I also I would also look for a younger generation that could, you know, could continue for our cause, that could continue to spread the history, the true side of the history to the generations and generations after. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're honored to have you in Guatemala. Welcome. Thank you so much. <laughs>